All right, Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. Verse 37, Luke eleven thirty-seven. 37, you might see a, a, a subtitle put in there in, the, in your translation that says the six woes, and Jesus is going to have a bit of a conversation, mostly one way, <laughs> with uh, the Pharisees and, and the, the teachers of the law, the scribes. So I think what I'm going to do is I want to read from verse 37 through the end of the chapter. And then we'll walk back through and, and just kind of uh, make our way through as many of these as we can tonight. So verse 37 of Luke chapter 11. When Jesus had finished speaking, a Pharisee invited him to eat with him. So he went in and reclined at the table. But the Pharisee, noticing that Jesus did not first wash before the meal, was surprised. The Lord said to him, Now then, you Pharisees, clean the outside, clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you're full of greed and wickedness. You foolish people, did not the one who made the outside make the inside also? But give what is inside the dish to the poor, and everything will be clean for you. Woe to you, Pharisees, because you give a tenth of your mint, rue, and all other kinds of garden herbs, but you neglect justice and the love of God. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. Woe to you, Pharisees, because you love the most important seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplace. Woe to you, because you're like unmarked graves, which men walk over without knowing it. One of the experts of the law answered him, Teacher, when you say these things, you insult us also. And Jesus replied, And you experts in the law, woe to you, because you load people down with burdens uh, they can hardly carry, and you yourselves will not lift one finger to help them. Woe to you, because you build tombs for the prophets, and it was your forefathers who killed them. So you testify that you approve of what your forefathers did. They killed the prophets, and you build their tombs. Because of this, God in his wisdom said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill, and others they will persecute. Therefore, this generation will be held responsible for the blood of all the prophets that has been shed since the beginning of the world, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, this generation will be held responsible for it all. Woe to you experts in the law, because you've taken away the key to knowledge. You yourselves have not entered, and you have hindered those who were entering. When Jesus left there, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law began to oppose him fiercely and to, to besiege him with questions, waiting to catch him in something he might say. Okay, now there's a whole lot there. But before we kind of break this down, it... Do you have any just initial reaction to what you see happening there and hear Jesus saying? Anything catch your mind just in general as you're, as you're taking that in? He looks at them with hypocrites. A major charge of hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yes. What, what specifically doesn't sound like that? It's just straight out judgment. It's just straight out holding accountable, isn't it? Judgment. Okay. Mm -hmm. Judgment upon the Pharisees, the teachers of the law. Everybody in the room sounds like it. Yeah. Yeah, that might be. No hope. No grace. It's coming. It's, it's going to hit hard. It's like the gospel. It's going to hit hard. 
Any other reactions? I didn't remember that he was at eating with Pharisees. I know he had spoken to people, but this is like a, he's right in there. They've invited he, him he's in. He's right in the house. Yes. He's right. You know, one of the things I think we want to keep in mind is that when we read the Gospels, like this is a different setting from Matthew 23. If you go back to Matthew 23, as a matter of fact, the order, there's, there's a lot of things that are not, they're, they're parallel. But there's a lot of things you read in Matthew 23 that tells you this is, these are two different instances. Uh, when I tend to think of the, 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 the woes upon the Pharisees and teachers of the law, I think I probably think of Matthew 23 first. Uh, but you're right, this is, this is in, in the setting of a meal and probably seven different times. And you all can add, count these up as you read the Gospel of Luke. But about seven different times, Luke points out that Jesus, some of his, a lot of his teaching took place upon invitation at a meal in someone's home. Steve? It kind of resembles a two-tiered system of justice, doesn't it? Resembles what? That's certainly one of the accusations. Mm -hmm. he, he's like, you know, you're no better than anybody else. You've probably heard me say this if you've been around a while along the way, that any time I read and hear Jesus teaching, uh, rebuking the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, I tend to take that really close to heart uh, as a pastor. And... Uh, and I think as, as any leader in the church needs to take that really to heart. Kind of raising a question of do we see ourselves in here in any of these challenges and accusations? Any of these charges against the Pharisees? Jesus is not, he's at a point in his ministry, he's not holding back. He's calling things what they are. He's seeing what they're doing and the responsibility they have and he is calling them out. And you're preventing people from coming to know me. You're preventing people from coming to the living God. It's like they're being stumbling blocks. Yes. Yes. And, and he starts in, in verse 39. He says, you, you, clean the, you clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you're full of greed and wickedness. And he calls them foolish people. Did not the one who make, made the outside make the inside also? You know, you need to take care of the inside. And the outside. He could see the inside, but nobody else could. All they were looking at was the facade that they had of the outside. You know, and it looked good, I guess. You know, uh, there were probably around 6,000 Pharisees at that time. Um, there? In, no, no, not, not, this is in a home. But in, in Israel. Um, but when you think about that, that's not an incredibly large number. It's, it's a, it's, these are, this is a lay organization. This is a group that sprang out of, they had, they had a wonderful start. They sprang out of a desire to pull back from, from the world and the influence of, of, at that time, Syrian occupation. And wanted to, literally, it means to be set apart, Pharisee to be set apart. They wanted to be apart with God. And the, the, the problem is, they made it so burdensome so difficult I don't know if this will make any sense to you let me let me attempt I am not an artist okay but if this is a law of God a command okay oh why I'm not even gonna try to write that 
This is a command of God, okay? You could take any of the Ten Commandments. You could take, uh, let's say, keep the Sabbath day holy, okay? So their thought was to keep from breaking this law, the actual command, let's create laws that build a fence around the law. Like, let's create this law, let's create this law, let's create this law, this law, this law. And they start building, like trying to, to keep people from breaking across into the actual commandment. And before long, you've got a fence. They might break these the tradition of the elders, we'll call it. They might break those without ever coming close to breaking the actual commandment. At least that was the thought process. Can you see a problem that develops out of that? Here's one law, one command. And all of a sudden, you've got all of these centered around the one to keep you from breaking the one, the fence around the law. Modern day. There's a whole lot to keep up with. What, 630 some? So many positive, so many negative. And if you remember, there was a question raised one time. Kind of, you get the sense that, that this teacher of the law was burdened by all of this and he's just saying what do I need to pay attention to what's the greatest commandment of all get to the heart of it and you remember Jesus response right love the Lord your God with all your heart mind soul and strength and your neighbor as yourself vertical horizontal relationships and that's the heart of the commandments, the heart of the Sermon on the Mount, the heart of Jesus' teaching. And all the way through here, Jesus is challenging this. Um, now, you may or may not like this. It's okay. But, one tiny little example is that we can be insistent on how we look when we come to church. Okay? And we might be very, pay very close attention to how we look, that we are dressed to the hilt. Because in our mind, and this is perfectly, this is, this is, there's, there is nothing wrong with this thought. You're giving your best for God. Where it becomes a problem is when you become so concerned about how you present yourself on the outside that you don't pay attention to what's going on in your heart. You don't pay attention to what's going on in your mind. And that can be an issue. We might look the part but when we go out to eat on Sunday afternoon and we have a waiter or waitress that's getting frazzled because they've got so many tables and we don't show our patience and we don't show that we care about that waiter or waitress at all, how do you think that comes across? Looking good, but the attitude looks horrible. Same kind of challenge. Verse 42. This is really the first woe. Woe to you Pharisees because you give a tenth of your mint, rue, uh, and, and other kinds of garden herbs, but you neglect justice and the love of God. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. He's not condemning them for giving a tenth of all of their produce. What's he condemning them for? Neglect. 
Neglect of what? Love of God. I was trying to be all encompassing there. He, he's, he's pretty specific on this. He, the neglect deals with justice, justice mm -hmm. and love of God. You remember, I don't think I marked it, but you remember Micah 6, verses 6 through 8? Yep. Not with God before you, O man. And before he got to that, with what shall I come before the Lord? I'm, I'm in Micah 6, 6, if you just listen. And bow down before the exalted God. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings? calves a year old will the lord be pleased with thousands of rams ten thousand rivers of oil shall i offer my firstborn for my transgression the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul and then god says through micah he showed you O man what is good and mary was saying it what does the lord require of you to act justly to love mercy and to walk humbly before your God. He's challenging them. Challenging, Micah was challenging the, uh, the leaders and the prophets and the people of the Old Testament. Jesus is challenging the, the teachers, the ones who are responsible for teaching and paving the way and leading people into knowing how to relate to the living God. He's basically grading them and giving them an F at this point. Okay? Second, woe, woe to you Pharisees because you love the most important seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplace. In the, in the synagogue, there was usually a bench that was right in front of it was literally called the ark, but we get, we get con, we'll get confused with that. It was like a, a, a beautiful container cabinet that had the scrolls. And there was a bench in front of that. And that was the, that was the spot. Okay, if you sat down there, everybody's going to see, everybody's going to recognize you. Um, The greetings in the marketplace, they like to be recognized. You tell me that doesn't cross my brain often. You know, about any recognition, any, any, there's, there's a constant checking of, of motivation. You know, why do we do what we do? And, I know I ask myself that quite often, checking that motivation. Why do I do what I do? When it comes to preaching, teaching, visiting, whatever it might be, counseling. I think it's a great question for any of us. Deacons, leaders in the church, teachers of Sunday school, youth advisors, children workers. Why do we do what we do? The third woe, woe to you because you're like unmarked graves which men walk over without knowing it. This is a little different. Like if you read Matthew 23, he talks about you whitewash the tombs. Why, did, why would they whitewash the tombs? So it's very visible and you wouldn't run into it, touch it. Most were above ground, but, but could be... I mean, he talks here about uh, men walk over without knowing it, so some obviously underground. Yeah, because the, to, to come in contact with someone that is dead made you unclean. Okay? There we go with all the 630, 30-some laws. Um, but what do you think they, he's meaning when he says, verse 44, you're like unmarked graves which men walked over without knowing it. 
Now, that's a little different from making sure it's whitewashed so you see it and don't touch it. He's talking about unmarked graves, which people walk over without knowing it. What do you think he's getting at there? They're dead and trying to leave the living? Spiritually dead, trying to, to lead people into a living relationship with God. Well, the Pharisees defiled themselves when they did all this stuff. When they uh, were breaking the law, they defiled themselves. Well, I think he's pretty much saying you're, you are defiled. Um, he, he, he is confronting them saying you, you are spiritually dead and you're trying to lead people to God and you can't do it and you're making them struggle it's the dead leading the dead pretty harsh pretty straightforward Right. That is very true, Beverly. Any, you know, at whether we're parents or we're just church folks that are trying our best to, to lead people to Jesus, to lead our friends and people in our neighborhoods, um, what we say is very important. It's very important. But what we do and how we act is even more important. Because we can preach a great message to people. We can tell the truth. But if we aren't living it, most often it's going to fall on deaf ears. And that, I don't think any of us want to do that. I think we have to be vigilant to make sure that we're in that communion, walking with the Lord. I really got kind of, I don't know what the right word is, tickled is not the right word, but the expert in the law said, teacher, when you say these things, you insult us. And here he is in, in, in the home of Pharisee. Again, at a point in ministry where he wants folks to understand who he is, what the truth is, and he's not holding back. And at the very end, you see he is making, there, there is a void and a gap, a gulf between the religious leaders and Jesus. And, every, and, and this, when this happens, that, that gulf just widens very deep. One of our West Virginia Baptist pastors, um, who pastors the Madison, First Baptist Church of Madison, Jim Butcher, wrote a, wrote a little book a number of years ago called Christian Pharisees. It's an interesting little book. Uh, pretty challenging in terms of what do we do that creates barriers for people coming to Jesus? good question to ask. It's a good question to really pray about and think about. Do we do things that inhibit people from understanding Jesus and coming to him? And that's what Jesus is challenging the religious leaders, the ones who are responsible to know the word, Old Testament, pointing to the Messiah, and, and they're struggling. They're failing. In doing it. Yeah, that's why Jesus said that teachers, or somebody said that teachers were going to be held to the higher. Jesus said that. Wait a minute, was that Jesus? That was Paul. Was that, that Paul? <laughs> Paul or Timothy. Teachers are held to a higher standard. 
Well, they've got authority, so people take it to heart and make right. it really hurt. Right. She, she was probably fed up, but not the same way. When I, when I, uh, I mean, there's teaching out there today that is leading millions astray. Yeah. Millions. I, uh, Pastor Jason wasn't going to be the one that was going to talk here today. It was going to be somebody else. And I said, Jason, I need to know. Is the person that's scheduled to come here going to say anything that's going to set us off? <laughs> I'm at a point where I'm not ready for that. I'm not going to fight that battle. Well, he certainly didn't. No. He was Matter of fact, he stepped in. Right he said, because he said, uh, maybe 50 50. And I said, <laughs> that's not going to work. If we're going to host, it's got to be somebody that's, that's going to bring the word. He said, well, I think I could do it. <laughs> it sounds like what I heard. <laughs> oh, Pastor Jason's a wonderful, wonderful guy. Wonderful guy. Well, I feel like I'm held accountable. Okay? So, um, so the, the expert in the law, which uh, a scribe, Pharis uh, not Pharisee, but teacher of the law in, in a lot of translations, did that stop Jesus? Did that slow him down? Yeah. Nope. I think he picked up steam. <laughs> and you experts in the law, woe to you because you load people down with burdens they can hardly carry. You yourselves will not lift one finger to help them. The burden, instead of the simple laws of God, all these other traditions and, 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 and laws of man, basically. Which probably puts into perspective what Jesus said, which is often quoted in, at times of sorrow, uh, in Matthew 11, verses 28 to 30. Jesus says, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. That's to stand in contrast to the burden that is too heavy to carry that the teachers of the law and the Pharisees are placing on them. Probably the one that catches me harder than anything else, and, and we need to talk about for a minute. Woe to you because, verse 47, because you build tombs for the prophets. It was your forefathers who killed them. So you testify that you approve of what your forefathers did. They killed the prophets and you build their tombs. Verse 50, therefore, this generation, speaking to the folks of that first century, this generation will be held responsible for the blood of all the prophets that has been shed since the beginning of the world, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the sanctuary. There's some debate about whether that's Zechariah the prophet, uh, because Zechariah is the last book of, uh, well, no, it's not. Malachi is the last book. But there's some thinking that it's Zechariah the prophet. I tend to think... It is the Zechariah of 2 Chronicles 24. And you can read that on your own. 2 Chronicles 24, uh, 20 through 22. There is a prophet there by the name of Zechariah that confronts uh, what is happening. And he's put to death because of it. But let's think about this for a couple of minutes. This generation will be held responsible for the blood of all the prophets that's been shed since the beginning of the world. I tell you, twice he says, this generation will be held responsible for it all. 
What is that all about? What is he telling them? What's he pointing to? What's, what's he saying here? How, how are they going to be held accountable? This is the last. Jesus is the, is the, is the end of the line. This is yep. God himself shows up, and if they can't accept that, then everything is gone. This is the end of the line of the prophets, right? Jesus. The one before him, what happened to John the Baptist? Beheaded. Beheaded. I was going to say in the book of Acts Peter and Paul held them accountable for the crucifixion of yep. Christ. Yeah, they did. Yep, and they're preaching. Peter and Paul both did. Right. And ultimately this is going to be fulfilled and brought to completion because Jesus took all our sin upon himself. He died and took the, the, the judgment for our sins upon himself. And that first century between the religious leaders and the government itself put him to death. So where does that leave the scripture? I'm not sure what you're asking. He's looking at that, that generation because all the fulfillment of the prophets, everything they were saying, everything they were pointing to was going to come to completion in Jesus. And, and as he was nailed to the cross and as he died on the cross for the sins of humanity, everything the prophets were pointing to, the, the eternal plan of salvation came to rest on what he did right there. Um, and like that, that's a good point Mary that, that when you get to the book of Acts uh, Peter and, and as, as he's preaching on Pentecost as, he's, as he preaches even before the Sanhedrin uh, Paul as he goes from place to place and gives his testimony and preaches holds them responsible you put to death the son of God now, you and I culpable? Sure we are, right? The only way we're not is if we're sinless. And that's none of us. We all need a Savior. And Christ died for our sins, right? He died for our sins. He, he paid the price for our sins. All right, thoughts? It's, it's not real uplifting, in, in this passage. I mean, it's, it's, it's harsh. It's, Larry used the word judgment. It's judgment. So you started out, I went, where in the world are you going to go with this? <laughs> Very interesting. I, again, and this is just me, I, I, I find myself... When I read all of this, every time I read it, I'm looking inward. I'm taking a hard look and making sure, you know, how are we doing things? You know, are we doing things the way we need to be doing them? Uh, how am I doing things? And, and, and I think it's, if, if I could encourage you, that would be something all of us can do, you know? Are, are we... If, if we had a one-on-one -on -one sit down with Jesus right now, because as we come to the Lord, I mean, Paul writes in, in 2 Corinthians 5, we are given the message of reconciliation to take to the world. He says, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making his appeal through us. We're in a position, are we in a position any different than the religious leaders and, and teachers of the law who are responsible for recognizing the Messiah and showing people the Messiah, we're in that same position as, as we live from day to day. We're more so because we know from the scripture who Jesus was. Yeah. 
We, we, yeah, we know. We know the rest of the story. Right. Very we, clearly. We are more responsible than for now yeah. than the Pharisees. Now, I guess if we want to look for a light at the end of the tunnel for the, for the, for the religious leaders, I praise God for the stories of Nicodemus of Joseph of Arimathea, Pharisees who saw the light, who saw the truth, who embraced the truth. Paul? Paul took some pretty special convincing, didn't he? <laughs> but, but he did. He did. There's a, you know, we could be pretty hard-headed. We can see the truth head on, know it's real, and say, uh-uh, not me. We would all be under that judgment if it wasn't for the grace of God. If it wasn't for the fact that he died for our sins and rose from the grave. We've all probably, as members of the church, did what Jesus is accusing them there. You didn't go in yourself and you kept everybody else from finding it too. I think we've all have to. We, yeah, to we, yeah, we have. We, we just, we just need to be very open to the Spirit of God, right? Lose opportunities every day. If we're open, there will be opportunity, and then what, what we do with those opportunities. I don't find anything more exciting than seeing the light come on in somebody's eyes, and seeing them understand who Jesus is, and just get hungry and go after it. That's exciting. But you don't see that light unless, unless we represent Exactly. <clears throat> and again, the, speaking of light, Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. And then he turns around and says, you're the light of the world, right? And let your light shine so that my Father may be praised and glorified. Okay? Okay. We're gonna we're gonna do one more uh, one more week on prayer. Uh, I was gonna end it actually this past Sunday, but I want us to look at Jesus' prayer in John 17. So you might that'll be where we wrap it up. You might take a good long look at John 17, and it's always fascinating to me on on his last moments in time with the disciples what what he chooses to pray about that and was the BSF lesson this week and it is powerful it is it's very powerful you can hold me accountable on it this Sunday <laughs> you might have to stand up there beside me and say hey <laughs> let's keep it going in the right direction here well we'll have to get Paul at all so. <laughs> okay let's stand together and pray thank you for your input a lot to think about Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word and some, honestly God, some, some sections of your word are much more fun to read um, and are just easy to be drawn to, but sections like this are very challenging and yet we want the whole counsel of your word and, and we know that your, your son's words to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law speak to us today. So may we take those words to heart. May we just simply walk with you day by day, be wide open to you and allow you to live and move and have your way in and through us. May others come to a saving knowledge of you. May we, God, show us if there's any way at all as individuals or as a church that we are a stumbling block, that we are putting up barriers for people. We don't want to be a hindrance in any way to your purposes. And it's in the precious name of your son, Jesus, we ask this. Amen. Thank you all.